Amen. Let's bow in prayer together. Holy Father, we thank you for this day. And Lord, I pray that today, especially today, Lord, that our delight would be in you. I pray this all the days of our life, but Lord, just to take it one day at a time, I pray that each of us right now would make a determination that during this time of worship, we are going to delight ourselves in the Lord. And I pray that as we delight in you, that you would direct our paths. I pray that our ears would be attentive, our minds would be eager to listen, and our hearts would be receptive to your truth. And I pray this morning that we would receive the Word of God as the Word of God and not as the Word of man. Lord, I continue to pray for revival, personal revival, corporate revival. Holy Father, let it begin in us. Let it begin in me. That we would burn with zeal to live our lives for the glory of God. That we would be motivated by the cross and empowered by your Spirit to reach those who do not know Christ. And it's in His name we pray and ask these things. Amen. I'd like to invite you this morning to open your Bible to the Old Testament book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 17 is where we will be this morning. However, we're going to look at the latter part of verse 16 to help set the context of this morning's message. And so 1 Kings uh, chapter 16, I know I said 17, but let's go ahead and start there in verse 16. 1 Kings chapter 16, and let's read verses 29 through 34 to get us started. However, the body of this morning's message will take place in chapter 17 and 18. 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 29, we read, In the thirty-eighth year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab the son of Omri began to reign over Israel. And Ahab the son of Omri reigned over Israel in Samaria, Samaria twenty-two years. And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord. More than all who were before him. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians. And he went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, in which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. In his days, Hael of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundation at the cost of Abram, his firstborn, and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest, the son of Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. A couple of things I want to highlight there. First of all, I want us to understand just the evilness of the day, uh, that we, of, of the context that we find ourselves in. The context of this narrative finds itself in a very wicked place. The king of Israel was King Ahab. And he was a very brutal, ruthless, and ungodly, a very immoral king. As a matter of fact, you'll see there that he built a temple for Baal. Baal was a pagan deity, a male deity. He also built an Asherah, which was a female pagan deity. And oftentimes, both of these idols were worshipped through all types of sexual immorality. And so we see that the king of Israel married outside of the covenant people. He married a woman by the name of Jezebel, which is perhaps the most ungodly, wicked woman in all of the Bible, even all of history. And so this wicked king marries this wicked woman, and they begin to reign over this nation, and it's not long before the nation itself is once again 
turned towards evil. So the nation of Israel finds itself in a very evil, wicked environment. The people have turned their hearts away from God and they are worshiping idols. It's not hard to correlate what's happening with the nation of Israel to what's happening in our own day. Um, Some people choose to bury their head in the sand and not face reality, but the reality is is that um, our nation as a whole is becoming progressively immoral. Charles Spurgeon in his day was challenged by what was called the downgrade. In Charles Spurgeon's day in England, people denied the authority of the Scripture. It was known as the downgrade controversy. And people had a low view of the Bible. And so Charles Spurgeon preached with such passion and power that it provoked revival. And once again, he, he, he believed that preaching solid biblical doctrine was the key to igniting a flame that would usher in revival. I believe, I believe that we face the same type of downgrade in our day. People deny the authority and the sufficiency of the Word of God. Christians themselves, Christians themselves, very rarely read the Word of God. There's a downgrade happening. There's a downgrade in the church. There's a downgrade in society. The question is, is is it our responsibility? Absolutely, it's our responsibility because after all, we're part of the problem. Let me read to you a quote. Some of you will know this quote. Some of you will not. But here's the quote. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. That is the famous quote of Martin Luther. Not Martin Luther King, but the Martin Luther of the 1500s. This statement was made when Martin Luther, on April, by... Martin Luther on April the 18th, the year 1521, when he was bought, brought before the Diet of Ver, Worms in Germany. The Catholic Church called him to recant. They, they, it was a trial to be held for the purpose of excommunicating Luther from the Catholic Church. Most of us know this as the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. In the 1500s, the Catholic Church was progressively evil and wicked, guilty of idol worship, the worship of images and icons. There was a famous quote that was going around Germany at this time, promoted by the Catholic Church. Here's the, here's the quote. A coin in a coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. So what they were teaching was, If you wanted to limit your time in purgatory, which purgatory itself is an unbiblical teaching, but they were teaching if you want to limit your time in purgatory, then if you'll just pay enough money. So the idea, when a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Well, when that phrase became popular, the popular cliche of the Roman Catholic Church, Luther said, you know what, I've had enough of this selling of indulgences. That's what it was called. And he wrote a sermon that was later turned into what is known as the 95 Theses. Luther did not want to leave the Catholic Church. He wanted to simply reform the Catholic Church. So what was common in that day, when you wanted to have a meeting with someone, you would would nail or post something on the cathedral door. Luther was not trying to cause a fight. He was doing just what was normal. So he nailed the 95 Theses on the door of Wittenberg, the cathedral door there in Wittenberg, Germany. And it caused a a great disruption, which led to the Diet of Worms, where Luther was brought before the Catholic Church and he was told to recant or be excommunicated. Luther responded by saying, Unless I be persuaded by the Scriptures, here I stand. I do no otherwise. So we find a similarity between Charles Spurgeon and Martin Luther. Both men 
were willing to stand for truth when no one else would. In the midst of a downgrade controversy, Charles Spurgeon stood firm in the faith when no one else would. When the church had found itself in idolatry and paganism, Luther stood for truth when no one else would. When I hear that quote by by Spur, or by uh, L- Luther, I'm always reminded of the French Foreign Legion's uh, motto. If I stumble, hold me up. If I fall, pick me up. If I run, shoot me. I would say to us as Christians that we are in a war and we should never forget it. We are, listen to me, we are in the midst of downgrade. Moral and spiritual compromise. Make no mistake about it. And people will disagree. But I say to you, the only way out of this mess that we're in is for God to send genuine revival. For God to send genuine revival. Solomon Stoddard is a name that perhaps some of you may know, others of you will, may not. Solomon Stoddard pastored the same church for 69 years. He pastored between uh, the 1600s into the early 1700s. I believe it was like 1669 to 1729. He pastored a church in Northampton, Northampton Massachusetts. Same congregation for 69 years. Solomon Stoddard faced the same issue. In his day, the church was apathetic. There was no difference between the culture than the Christian. And Solomon Stoddard stood and he said, the only, the only solution to this problem that we find ourselves in is for an awakening, for God to send genuine revival. Well, in that day, people didn't think a whole lot about revival and they didn't think a whole lot about awakenings. So many opposed Solomon Stoddard. But even though he was alone, Solomon Stoddard stood. And he wrote about awakening and he wrote about revival and he preached for the need of both until his dying day. Some of you know his son-in-law who followed him. Pastored the same church that his father-in-law did. Jonathan Edwards, you ever heard of him? Jonathan Edwards, for those of you who don't know, is considered to be the greatest theological mind throughout Christian history. Except for the Apostle Paul and Jesus, of course. Jonathan Edwards was essential in being used by God to usher in the first great awakening that began with Wesley and Whitfield in England and eventually found its way over to America through the preaching of a man by the name of Jonathan Edwards. But where did it begin in that Northampton area? It began not with Jonathan Edwards, but with Solomon Stoddard. A man who was willing to stand when no one else would. I would submit to you this morning, that's what we need. That's what we need in Christianity. That's what we need. We need Christians who are willing to stand for their convictions. Christians who are willing to stand upon the truths of the Bible. Christians who are willing to say, Thus saith the Lord, and I will not be moved. Here I stand. I can do no otherwise. We're lacking that type of courage. We're lacking that type of determination. The title for this morning's message is simply, There must be a heated determination to stand for God. If we are going to see revival, if we hope to be the spark that God uses to ignite a flame, then there must be a heated, a zealous, a fervent determination to stand for God. And that's exactly what we see in the prophet Elijah this morning. This type of zealous determination characterized revival leaders and leaders of reform throughout Christian history. 
As a matter of fact, when you study the Bible, hero, heroes of the faith, we see this in Hebrews chapter 11, heroes of the faith, they did not entertain fear. They did not entertain nor consider their personal agendas. And they would not entertain compromise. So when we think about the type of people that God uses to ignite a spark that could burst into a flame, it's individuals who do not entertain fear. Not saying that we won't be afraid at times, but we're not going to entertain the fear. Men and women who will stand and not consider their personal agendas above the agenda of God. And Christians who simply will not entertain compromise. Boy, howdy. How we need that today. Compromise everywhere. You say, Pastor, man, this is not a very uplifting sermon. You know it's the truth. And you and I have been part of the compromise. And thus, that's why I stand before you today and say that's why we are in so great need of revival is because we have compromised. But it's time to stand, dear people. Elijah, at the time that he stood before Ahab, do you realize that 400 prophets have already been killed? 400 prophets of God have already been killed by Jezebel. Or prophets have already been killed. I'm sorry, Obadiah was used by God to save 400. Let me make sure I said that right. Yeah, Obadiah took 400 prophets and he hid them by 50s. So prophets were being killed, but Obadiah himself hid 400. So here are these prophets being killed, and the ones that are not being killed are in hiding. But what do we find? We find this prophet by the name of Elijah standing... In the face of evil. Reminds me of Moses, doesn't it? When the nation of Israel was, the Hebrew people were in captivity in Egypt. And God said to Moses, go and oppose Pharaoh. I'm going to send your brother Aaron with you. And both men stood in the face of evil. They stood for God. They stood for truth. And they opposed evil. We saw the wickedness of Ahab, Jezebel, and the culture of the day. And now we come to chapter 17, verse 1. I love the way the Bible introduces Elijah. There's nothing spectacular about his introduction. You're reading along, and all of a sudden you come to chapter 17, verse 1, and look at this. Now Elijah the Tishbite, of all Tishbe and Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord lives, the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Man, what a profound statement. He says there will be, there's going to be a drought. There will be no dew, nor rain. There will be nothing except by my word. And as we go out and we read through the narrative, you're going to find out that Elijah was a very godly man that God used to do great things. And I'm just reminded of how minimal his introduction is in the Bible. There's no trumpets. There's no clanging cymbals. There's no loud announcements. Bum, 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 bum. Here comes Elijah, one of the greatest prophets of God of all time. No, what do we find? And here's Elijah the Tishbite. Just out of nowhere. Here's Elijah the Tishbite of Gilead. Why is his introduction so minimal? Because ultimately, at the end of the day, it's not about Elijah. It's about God. It's about Elijah's God. And at the end of the day, we have to remember that it's not about us. It's about our God. The reason we stand is not for us and for our glory. The reason that we stand is for God and His glory. John the Baptist, when they came to him and said, Who are you? Tell us who you are. Are you the prophet? Are you the Christ? John the Baptist responded by saying, I'm just a voice. Crying out in the wilderness. I'm not even worthy to untie the shoes of the one who is coming. Is it not time that we learn as Christians that it's not about us? 
It's not about our fears. It's not about our agendas. It's not about our what we want above what God wants. We have to realize it's not about us. Well, I'm not going to share my faith, Pastor Blake, because I'm afraid of what someone might say or what someone might do. I'm not going to do this because my friends won't like me or people won't want to be around me anymore. I'm not going to do this because I could lose my promotion at work. I'm not going to do this. I could lose my job. And, and so I'm not going to stand on these issues. I'm going to continue to compromise. We have to come to the reality where we say it's not about me, come what may, lest I be persuaded by the scriptures. Here I stand. I can do no otherwise. To God be the glory. And so in scene one, you know what we see? We see the prophecy of the prophet. What does the prophet prophesy? He says, listen, there's going to be no dew nor rain. rain." He prophesies a drought. Then immediately after he prophesies that drought, I want you to notice what God does. Look there. He prophesies the drought. Now look at verse 2, chapter 17, verse 2. And the word of the Lord came to him. Depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the book of Kareth, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens there to feed you. The birds <laughs> are going to bring him food. So he went and did, notice this, so he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and he lived by the brook of Kareth, that is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. Notice this. And after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land because of the drought. Let's go on and read on. Look at verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon. Dwell there. Behold, I've commanded a widow there to feed you. So he rose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there, gathering sticks, and he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. Remember, there's a drought. It's severe. And the woman said, verse 12, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar, and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself. My son, that we may eat and die. This is her way of saying, listen, this is all we have. This is the last, we don't have much, but this is the last of what we have. After we eat this, there's nothing left. We're going to starve to death. There's nothing left. How does the prophet respond? Verse 13, now Elijah said to her, Do not fear, go and do as you have said. First, make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. Wow, doesn't that sound selfish? It would if it wasn't a prophet who trusted in the Lord. He trusts in God. Why does he trust in God? Because God has already proven himself to be faithful. Where did God prove himself to be faithful? At the brook of Kareth. The Lord said, go to the brook of Kareth, and there I'm going to send ravens. To provide you with food. What do we see here in scene two? Scene one, we saw the prophecy of the prophet. Scene two, we see the preparation of the prophet. God's preparing him for something. What's God preparing him for? You'll see. How does God prepare his prophet? He puts him in a a place that is barren. By a brook. All alone. Puts him in a place where he's all alone. But then provides for him supernaturally. I'm convinced that most of us as Christians, we find ourselves always trying to get out of the lonely place, don't we? We murmur and we gripe, we complain, we speak against God. Oh God, woe is me, why am I here? And we don't even realize that God has us in a lonely place, place because He's preparing us for something. God, some of you are in the midst of a trial right now and you keep praying for God to deliver you out of it instead of, instead of praying for God to give you victory as you go through the midst of it. Maybe you should stop praying, God, get me out of this and start praying, God, help me to learn the lesson that you want me to learn while I'm in the middle, middle of it. You are preparing me for something. Have your way with me. You prepare me. 
That's what Elijah does. There he is. He goes. He sits at the brook. He's all alone. God sends the ravens. They feed him. God's teaching him something. He's teaching, him, he's teaching Elijah about his faithfulness. And then we come on and what do we find? The situation gets worse. It's one thing for you to be alone. It's another thing for you to come to a widow and her son who by all rights are going to die of starvation and then ask them for their last morsel of food. Notice that the, the trial progresses in its intensity. You see that? God is preparing his prophet for something. God prepares him by putting him on a trial in order to demonstrate his faithfulness to his prophet. There's a word in that. There's a message in that for some of you this morning. So we see the preparation of the prophet. The woman does, as the prophet says, Elijah verse 15, and he and she went and did as Elijah said, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, because according to the word of the Lord that he spoke to Elijah. God's faithful. In scene three, you know what we see? I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this one. You know what we see in scene three? We see the passion of the prophet. The passion of the prophet. Let me just tell you how it plays out. In verses 17 and following there, the widows, the same widow we just heard about, her son dies. Her son dies. She comes to the prophet and she says, His illness is so severe that there was no breath left in him. Elijah says in verse 19, Give me your son. And he took the boy in his arms and he took him up to his chamber where he had lodged. And he cried out to the Lord. Notice what he does. You see that there in verse 20. He cries out to the Lord, Lord my God. Then in verse 21, he stretches himself upon the child. Not once, not twice, but three times he prostrates himself over the dead child's body. As he's crying out to the Lord. God hears his cry and God brings life back into the child and the child is resurrected from the dead. Now notice this, the widow has not said this up to this point yet, but now she says it. Look at what she says, verse 24, this is key. And the woman said to Elijah, now I know you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth, that it's truth. Wait a minute, she had already seen the flour multiply. She had already seen the oil multiply. But it wasn't until she saw the passion that, she, that he had for one lost soul that she said, now I know that you are a man of God. Let me say to us this morning, church, it's not about how many diplomas you have hanging on your wall. Seminary degrees do not make you a a a passionate man of God does not make you a man of God. Let me say this to you. Being a part of a Bible study does not make you a man or woman of God, even though we encourage that, and that's part of the getting there. But there are a lot of people who attend Bible studies who are a mile wide and an inch deep. Holding a position in a church does not make you a man or woman of God. What is it that makes one a man or woman of God? It's the passion that they have for one lost soul. When the woman saw his passion for the glory of God, when she saw his passion for one lost soul, she said, now I know that you are a man of God. We need people who are willing to stand firm, flat-footed, with a passion for souls. Here I stand I will do no otherwise. I shall not be moved unless I'm persuaded by the Scriptures. Why? Because my passion is for the glory of God and for the salvation of men, women, and children. So I will not give in to fear. I will not put my agenda before God's. And I will not compromise truth. Is it obvious that it's his passion that enabled him to stand? His passion for God? We could say his compassion for people? 
The prophet's now prepared. He's now prepared. His passion is manifested itself. He's ready. He's ready. He's ready for that great task that God now has in front of him. Chapter 18, verse 1. After many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show yourself to Ahab. Sound anything like Moses? Go and stand before Pharaoh. Go and show yourself to Ahab. Wait a minute. This is the king whose wife is killing all the prophets. <laughs> You're prepared. You had to go through a lonely place and a desperate place. You had to go through two specific trials to get there, but you're prepared now. Your passion is where it needs to be. You're ready. Now I want you to go stand before Ahab. Go show yourself to Ahab and I will send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. It was so severe that Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. And when the Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in caves and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said to Obadiah, Go throughout the land and all the springs of water to all the valleys. Perhaps we may find grass to save the horses and the mules alive and not lose some of the animals. Notice that Ahab, instead of seeking God for rain, what does he do? What does he, do? he takes matters into his own hands and he says, Let's go try to, let's go try to find some grass and, and some other resources so that the animals do not die. He's still unwilling to seek God. So Ahab and Obadiah, verse 6, they divided themselves. Ahab went one direction by himself. Obadiah went another direction by himself. And Obadiah was on his way, and behold, Elijah met him. And Obadiah recognized him, and he fell on his face and said, It is you, my Lord, Elijah. And he answered, It is I. Go and tell your Lord, Behold, Elijah is here. And he said, what? <laughs> Have I sinned that you would give your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? As the Lord your God lives, Elijah, there is no nation or kingdom where my Lord has not sent me to seek you. Ahab has sent me throughout the country looking for you. And every time I would come back, I would tell him, Elijah, that I could not find you. Because I truly could not. And now you want me to go and say to Ahab that I have found you? Surely he will think I'm lying and he will kill me. Verse 11, now you say, go and tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. Perhaps Elijah, as soon as... As soon as I leave, maybe God takes you away somewhere else. And when I come back, you're not here. Elijah said, verse 15, As the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab, and he told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And when Ahab saw Elijah, notice this, when Ahab saw Elijah, look here, Ahab said to him, It is you, you troubler of Israel. It is you. You have troubled Israel. I have not troubled Israel. It's because you have turned from the commandments of God to worship Baal. You are the true troubler of Israel. And
And then he puts the king to a contest. He says, Ahab, call, call the prophets of Baal together and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel. Bring the 450 prophets of Baal. Bring the 400 prophets of Asherah. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and he gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people. Notice his, he's in the face of opposition. In the, in the eyes of the world, he's a fanatic. He's a freak. Elijah says to the people, as he looks at the nation, he says to them, How long will you go limping between two opinions? How long will you continue in your compromise? If the Lord is God, follow Him. If Baal is God, then follow Him. Sound anything like Joshua? Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then Elijah said to the people, I, even I, only am left of the prophets of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450. Let two bulls be given to us. Let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood. But put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull, and I will lay it on the wood, and I'll put no fire to it. Then basically, here's how it plays out. Plays out. You pray to your God, Baal, and I'll pray to my God, Yahweh. And which, whoever sends the fire to consume the sacrifice, that will be the true God. And so the 450 prophets of Baal, they build their altar, they take their bull, they offer it on the, on, the, on the altar as a sacrifice. Elijah even allows them to go first, verse 26, and they took the bull that was given to them, and they prepared it, and they called upon the name of Baal, they called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, answer us, but there was no voice. And no one answered them. They lipped around, I love the way the narrator describes them, they lipped they limped around the altar that they had made. It's a sign of weakness. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry louder! Cry louder! For he is a God. Either he is musing himself, or he is relieving himself, or perhaps he's on a journey. Or maybe he's asleep and just needs to be awakened. A little bit of trash talking. And then they cried even louder. And not only did they cry this time, but like most pagan societies do, they begin to cut themselves in order to appease their God. And the Bible says, with swords and lances, and the blood gushed out upon them. And midday passed, and they, and again, I love this word, they raved on until the time of the offering. They're lipping, they're cutting, they're crying, they're calling, they're ravening, they're lunatics. But there was no voice, no fire, no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near. And all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down or thrown down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord came saying, Israel shall be your name. And he took the 12 stones, symbolic of the 12 tribes. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench. Notice what he does. He goes even further. He digs a trench around the altar. As great as would contain two seahs of seed. And he put the wood in order and he cut the bull in pieces and he laid it on the wood. And he said... 
Fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. Now the prophets of Baal did not have to do that, but he's about to prove something. So they dig a trench, they get these pails of water, they pour it on the altar. He said, do it a second time, and they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time, and they did it a third time. And the water ran the altar, off the altar, and filled the trench also with water. And at the time of the offering, offering of obligation, oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, Notice, O Lord, O God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that these people may know that you are Lord, that you alone are God, and that they have turned their backs on you. Then the fire of the Lord fell. <laughs> Consumed the burnt offering. And the wood and the stones and the dust. It's dust. Licked up the water as in a trench. The water was gone. And the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal, and let none of them escape. And they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon, and he slaughtered them there. And then Elijah said to Ahab, Go up and eat and drink, for there is a sound of rushing rain. So Ahab went to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel. And when he bowed himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees, and he said to his servants, Go up now, look toward the sea. And when he went up and looked towards the sea, there was, there was nothing and he said again seven times. And at the seventh time he said, Behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, Go up and say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot and go down lest the rain stop you. And in a little while the heavens grew black with clouds and wind. And there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. And he gathered up his garment. And he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Rain fell. Revival came. Go back to verse 39. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their face and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Elijah was a spark that ignited a flame. I told you that we saw the prophecy of the prophet prophet, the preparation of the prophet, the passion of the prophet. But in that last scene, you know what we saw? The pleasure of God. The pleasure of God. It brought God great pleasure to prove Himself that day that He alone is God. It, God, it brought God great pre- pleasure that day to, con- to affirm His prophet by consuming the altar. It brought God great pleasure that day to bring revival to His people. The pleasure of God was invoked when the prophet of God was willing to stand. I want to know this morning, are you willing to stand? You say, Pastor, how do we stand first through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? That's where it all begins. You've got to be saved. Second, you've got to put on the whole armor of God every day. You want to stand, and you've got to put on the belt of truth. What is the belt of truth? You've got to know solid biblical doctrine. Know what the Bible teaches. And gird your loins up with that truth. And then put on the breastplate of righteousness. Live your life according to this word. Know this word. Live your life according to it. Live that righteous life. Then take up the shield of faith. Believe this word. Not should you know it. Not, should, not only should you obey it. You believe it. You trust God. You believe his word. Take up the shield of faith. Have your feet shod with the gospel of peace. 
Everywhere you go, you live gospel-centered. Be a gospel-centered individual. Whether you're going to Chick-fil-A or to Walmart, your feet are centered in the gospel. Whether you're going to school or work, your feet are centered in the gospel. Put on the helmet of salvation. You set your mind on things above. Not on earthly things, not on temporal things, but things which matter, things which are eternal. I'm going to know this truth. I'm going to obey this truth. I'm going to believe this truth. I'm going to carry this truth with me wherever I go. And I'm going to set my mind on the things that this truth teaches. Because it is my sword. It is my weapon. And God uses this weapon to enable me to stand against all that is wicked. It is my defense. It's my sword. So let me ask you in conclusion. Will you stand with the one who stood for you over 2,000 years ago? Jesus stood. Jesus faced evil. Knowing what he would endure before he even came. But Jesus humbled himself coming uh, from heaven to earth. Born as a baby in a manger. And he faced mocking and ridicule as he lived out his earthly ministry. He was even called the devil. Accused of being fanatic. When his disciples left him and they all betrayed him, Jesus continued to stand. When he stood before the high priest and they pulled out his beard and they slapped him in the face and they spit upon him, he continued to stand. When they brought him before Pot of, or Pilate, he continued to stand. When he was beaten with a cat of nine tails and his back was lacerated, he continued to stand. When he was nailed to a cross, he continually stood. And there upon the cross, when he was faced, faced with absorbing the full cup of God's wrath against our sin, what did he do? He stood. Took our sin upon himself, absorbed the full cup of God's wrath, and turned it over until it was empty. And do you know that Jesus Christ stands in heaven for those who stand for him? You say, wait a minute, Jesus is seated in heaven. You'll recall that when Stephen stood for Jesus and stood for the gospel, and he was martyred and stoned to death outside the walls of Jerusalem, the Bible says that Jesus, he saw Jesus standing up. Stephen stood for Jesus in the face of death and Jesus stood for him. Will you stand? Even when your friends will not? Will you stand for righteousness when everyone else is doing wrong? Will you stand when everyone is watching? Will you stand when no one is watching? Will you stand for truth when laws are passed that contradict the Bible? Will you stand when your health fails? Will you stand when someone you love dies? Will you stand if it costs you a promotion? Will you stand if it costs you your job? Will you stand if you are persecuted? Will you stand if it means losing your life? Will you stand if all hell breaks loose? Will you stand even if no one else will? Will you stand if it costs you everything? As for me and my house, we stand with the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that once again that we would be a congregation that seeks personal and corporate revival. Just start there. Personal and corporate. Ultimately, we want global revival, global awakening. But God, let us, let me, oh, let this be our prayer, church. You make it personal. God, let me be the spark that ignites a flame. When you choose to prepare me, I pray that I would not resist it. 
And I know that you prepare me, you take me through trial to prove what my passion truly is. And I know that when I submit to your preparation, and when my passion is right, that God, you'll use me, and you'll use other people in here to do great and extraordinary things for your glory. So I pray that for us. That we would submit to your preparation. And if our passion is proven to be misplaced, I pray that we would repent. But I believe if we truly submit to your preparation, to your trial, God, you'll prove our passion. If we trust you through it, our passion will be genuine. And then we'll be prepared to be used by you. Have your way in me, Lord. Have your way in me. Have your way in me. Let that be our prayer this morning. Have your way in me. Have your way in me. Lord, I pray for those this morning who need to be saved. For those who have still never given their lives to Jesus, Lord, I pray for them. That that would be their stand this morning. That here in a moment, when we physically stand, that they would come and trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And that they would stand with Jesus today and be saved. I pray for them. I pray for fathers to rise up and stand. To lead their families. For youth to stand. For children to stand. For women to stand. Employees and employers to stand for truth. Even if it costs us everything. Let this not be sermon talk. Let it be genuine. And Lord, I shall say in conclusion. That only by your grace. And your grace alone. Shall we stand. The glory is yours. Oh, may we have a heated determination. To stand with our God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand now and begin to come as the Lord leads? Would you come?